time, I'd love for you to take a minute sometime during the service and open up that worship guide you got on your way in. On the second page, you're going to see this perforated communication card, and that's the best way for us to hear from you. We'd love to know your questions. We'd love to know how we can help you, how we can partner with you on your, on your spiritual journey. So just simply take a few minutes to fill that out, and after service, you can drop that off in our offering drop boxes at every exit. And it's our best way that we can help you get connected at a more meaningful level. Well, summer's been amazing. I mean, we've seen God do some awesome things. We had an incredible week of kids camp. We're about to do a week of, of student camp down in Panama City Beach. But man, there's still more great things that we have planned for this summer. And one of those is happening at the very end of the month. That's baptism. We end our summer with a big baptism celebration. One of the things that we are all about here is more life change. We're a church that gets to see life change stories written every single week. And there's no greater way to share your life change story than to get baptized. It symbolizes who we are. It's kind of the wedding ring of the faith. You see, I wear this ring to let everybody know whose team I'm on. I'm taken by Erica. You know, baptism is the same thing. This ring isn't what makes me married. This ring is what demonstrates my commitment. Well, baptism doesn't save anybody. It doesn't even change anybody. It's simply the wedding room of our faith, how we express, I once was lost, then God, and now I'm found. So if you want to share your story through baptism, if you want to get more questions answered about spiritual decisions and, and going public with your faith and letting people know what Jesus means to you, you can mark that on the communication card as well and drop that in the bucket after service. Hey, well, let's go ahead and stand up. God's going to do something special today. I already saw it happen at the 9.30 a.m., so get ready. Something crazy is about to happen. Let's not hold back. Let's worship together. Here we go. Good morning. I'm excited to worship with you this morning, and let's celebrate the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. He's here, and he is moving.
you, Lord Jesus. Thank you that you are in this place and that you're making all things new. You are so awesome, Father, and we just love you today. You are strong in our brokenness and you're sovereign over every step, God. We make our plans, but you plan our steps. And we give you praise this morning. God is the lion, the lion of Judah, and he is roaring with power, and he's fighting our battles, and every knee will bow before him. Oh, our God is the lamb, the lamb that was slain for the sins of the world. His blood breaks the chain And every knee will bow before the lion and the lamb Oh, every knee will bow Come on, let's sing that again Oh, our God is the lion The lion of Judah He is roaring with power And he is fighting
Father, we just love you so much today. We thank you for all that you are and for all that you're doing and for all that you're going to do. Lord, as we just open our hearts to you, Lord, I pray that you would just open us up to hear what you have to say this morning. Because in your presence, we are made new. God, I just ask that you would change us today as we just soak in your presence and we, we soak in the word. Father, we're listening. Speak to us today. We love you. Amen. Well, good morning, Mountain Lake. Go ahead and take a seat. Or should we just all go home after that? I'm not going to top that. <laughs> Well, my name is Brian Haas. I'm, uh, I'm the Dawson campus pastor. Uh, if you didn't know, we are actually uh, one church in different locations. We have our Forsyth campus, and then uh, just a few miles north, we have our Dawson County campus as well. And so I get to be up there week in and week out. But today, Chris and I got to swap. So uh, the Dawson folks get to hear uh, Chris's heart and just see him, hear from him uh, this morning. And you guys are stuck with me, but it's going to be great. Uh, so we're excited for, for what God is going to be doing. Oh, well, thank you. It is cool, though, because you don't know everything that God's been doing in Dawson County, and our Dawson County folks don't always know everything that God's been doing here. It's neat to be part of something bigger than yourselves, and that's what we get to be part of every single week at Mountain Lake. More life change across two different campuses in two different counties, and it's awesome to see what God continues to do through each and every one of you in the larger and the bigger picture. Well, do me a favor. When you walked in, uh, you got a worship guide. Nathan was talking a little bit about it, but I want you to do something for me. Open it up to the notes section, and I want you to write write the word aha. It's a series we've been going through this entire summer, and it's a series all based around what book of the Bible? Proverbs. Good. I will tell Chris you have actually been listening and paying attention. Good job. So yes, write just the word aha, and, and here's what I'm wanting you to do with that. Um, we're going to spend the next about 25 minutes together looking into God's word, sharing and helping us understand what God's word is saying to us and what we do with that. But God's spirit speaks to each and every one of us differently. We're all in different places. We are in uh, different situations and different stages of life. And so what I want you to be listening to is what God would give you as your aha this morning. And it's going to be a passage that we read. It's going to be an idea we throw up on the board, something on the screen. Uh, I want you to just write down the word aha, and you'll know it when you get it. Because you'll be just listening to me like, ah, that's what God wanted me to hear this morning. So just write the word aha and then be listening for that one aha moment that God is going to speak to you about this morning. As you said, you are good listeners with Chris, is that yes, we're going through a study of Proverbs. And Proverbs is all about that one W word. It is wisdom. wisdom. Yes. But we need to be on the same page because the book of Proverbs kind of it really leads us to wisdom. It doesn't just straight up give us wisdom. It leads us to it. And there's three parts that get us eventually to wisdom. The first one is just knowledge. It's just facts. And tell me, if you have a coffee cup in your hand, or just hold your coffee cup up real quick, or tea, any hot beverage, whatever. All right, so if you've got a hot drink, coffee or tea, perfect. The fact of your coffee or your tea is it's hot, right? Your coffee is hot. It is a fact. It is just knowledge. You know it. And Proverbs speaks to that, of knowledge, but then it takes us to the next step of understanding or the meaning behind that. We begin to work with the facts. It's the, it's the knowledge, but now how do we work with it? So for you guys with coffee, you know it's hot. The, the understanding would say, it could burn me. I understand that, I know that it's hot, and I understand that it might burn me. It could burn me. Now right here, we're still not at wisdom yet. We have the facts, we're beginning to work with it and see how the facts interact with our everyday lives, but then you take it one step further, now we get to wisdom. Wisdom says, I'm not going to drink it yet. Why? Because it could burn me. Why? Because it's hot. That's the process of wisdom by which we then grow and how God's word is going to be growing us this morning. We go from facts, just knowing it, to understanding it to the point of, well, here's what I'm actually going to do with it. It's the application so that's why that aha is so important because it's not just what do I know and what do I understand, but it's what am I going to do with it? How do I begin to live this out in my life? Godly wisdom helps us get a glimpse into God's heart and God's eyes and God's mind. Godly wisdom helps us look at every person, every relationship, every situation, every event, every environment through God's eyes and with God's heart. So I'm going to show you one of my ahas in studying through uh, Proverbs this summer. If you've got your Bibles, head to Proverbs chapter 24. 
Proverbs chapter 24, this is a theme we see in multiple scriptures, uh, and it's the theme, and it's a great word, the word of sluggard. So let me, let me show this to you real quick. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 30. It says, I went past the field of a, and say that word with me, of a what? Sluggard. I went past the field of a sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. Thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds, and the stone wall was in ruins. Verse 32, look at this. I applied my heart to what I observed. And learned a lesson from what I saw. You see the shift from knowledge to then understanding now to wisdom. I saw something. I observed it. I'm understanding what that means. Here's the wisdom. Here's the lesson. Here's how I apply it, as he says here, to my heart. I applied to my heart what I saw and observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. A little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest. And poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. That word sluggard there, let's be on the same page, is referring to a lazy person. Some translations even say lazy bones. And in another spot in Proverbs chapter 14, actually says a sluggard would put food in its hand, but never lift it up to its mouth. Just too lazy to even take the food from the hand to the mouth. That's a sluggard. It is not somebody who cannot work. It's not somebody who's in between jobs. It's not somebody that's retired. This is somebody that is refusing to work. A lazy person, lazy bones, and it's actually found 14 times throughout Proverbs. A pretty big theme in this book all about wisdom, how we interact with work. Now you notice in the very end of this section here, verses 33 and 34, there's a warning with it, isn't there? The warning says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest, poverty will come on you like a thief, scarcity like an armed man. In other words, there are some consequences to being lazy, to being a sluggard for refusing to work, refusing to work. Now, does that mean that rest is, is bad? We should never rest. No, of course not. There is this healthy rhythm, not necessarily a balance, but it's a healthy rhythm of work and then how we interact with rest. Now, please understand this. When I'm saying rest, I'm not saying relaxing, right? Relaxing is just throwing your feet up and then binging on Netflix. That doesn't give you much rest. That doesn't refill you. You're not doing anything, but it's not true rest. Here, we see that God is through his His spokesperson Solomon in this part of Proverbs is saying, be aware, be warned. We have to make sure we have work and rest in balance. In fact, in the very beginning, if you go to Genesis chapter 2, you don't have to turn there, I'll put them on the screens for you. Genesis chapter 2, God is, is finishing creation. And this is before sin, this is before the fall of man, this is the world at its most perfect moment. And I want you to see three things, all out of Genesis chapter two. Verse three says this, then God blessed the seventh day and made it holy because on it he what? What did he do? Rested. Because on it he rested from all the work of creating that he had done. So he actually instituted rest. Because of all the work, now we must rest. Now if you keep going, verse 15, look at the second thing God did here. The Lord God took the man, Adam, and put him in the garden of Eden to do what? What's it say? To work it and take care of it. Remember, this is, this is perfection. In the very beginning, when God finished creation, before sin, God gave us rest, but also gave us work. He gave the garden to Adam to actually work it. Verse 24, last thing God gave us. That is why a man leaves his father and mother and is united to his wife and they become one flesh. Here's what we see here. Very beginning, God finishes creation and it is perfect, it is good. No sin in the world yet. And God, in addition to his presence, because scripture shows us that God walked around with Adam and Eve, God gave us his presence, he gave us work, he gave us rest, and he gave us what? What was the last one? Family. He gave us relationships. That's in a perfect world. Relationship with God, work, rest, and family. Now, if I were to ask you to paint me a picture of your perfect day, you probably would not include work in your perfect day. (laughs) Usually not. But that's what God is doing here. He's saying that perfection is that, yes, you have a relationship with me, that you're working, that you're resting, and then you have family. Work is good. Work is given to us by God. The problem, usually the problem for us, is we get all of those out of balance. When you look at our relationship with God and work and rest and family, the issue is not that we have those. The issue is we get them out of rhythm, out of, out of balance. But notice we have to have both. Specifically with work and rest, remember the order there? It says that God rested from all of his what? Work. He rested from all of his work. The order is very important. We don't rest and then think about working. 
Well, we can, but it's not very productive. (laughs) We work, and then from our work, then we move into rest. If we rest without working, that's leisure. That's vacation. Take a vacation. I head on vacation next week. We should have those, but you do come back from vacation. You should come back from vacation. You do have to jump back into work at some point. It's for a time. We work, and then we rest. If we rest without work, it just becomes leisure or eventually laziness if we never get back to work. Because true rest only happens after we truly work. True rest. I mean, the rejuvenating, the refilling, the refreshing type of rest only happens after we truly work. Let me do an experiment with you real quick. So I have a cup of lemonade, and I want to see what this will taste like here in just a second. Okay. You ready? You ready to be amazed? Here we go. Tastes like Kroger lemonade. (laughs) Yeah, exactly what I bought, Kroger lemonade. Nothing fancy. It's kind of bad lemonade, but it's okay, right? Now, I want you to imagine that you've just finished working out in the yard. Maybe you were mowing and weeding and edging. And, And I'll even go one step further for you. I have a manual edger, not even one of those electric or gas ones. Like, you know what I'm talking about? I don't have a very long driveway, thank goodness, or I wouldn't have one. But think of all the work that you would put into your yard and you've been out there all Saturday and it's hot and then you come and you sit down and you take a drink of lemonade. What does it taste like then? Oh, it's the best thing ever. It doesn't taste like cheap Kroger lemonade anymore. No, it is the best thing your lips have ever tasted. You couldn't believe it and imagine it could taste so good. Is that because the lemonade transformed? No, it's because we did something to then deserve it and earn it. We got it in the right order. We worked And then we were able to rest. The order is important. True rest only happens after we truly work. Now that tells us to work. Work is good. God gave us work in the very beginning, even before sin. Remember, time with God, a relationship with God, work, rest, and family before sin. Now that doesn't tell us how to work. What's the word for that? How we work is also known as a work what? Ethic, yes, a work ethic. Proverbs speaks to that as well. So yes, work, work hard, don't be lazy, don't be a sluggard, work, God gave it to us. But here's how we work. Proverbs 6, starting in verse 6, or I'm sorry, chapter 6, starting in verse 6, says this. Go to, to, go to the ant, you, here it is again, you sluggard. Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and gathers its food at harvest. Go to the ant, you sluggard. God uses a a insignificant, tiny little insect to teach us work ethic, to teach us how to work within wisdom and within the biblical context. Now, here's a fun little fact for you on ants, a little National Geographic for you. An ant can lift and carry 50 times its body weight, super strong. That would be the same as a second grader. If you were to go out here down into MLC Kids, that would be the same as a second grader picking up, lifting, and then carrying a Toyota Prius. That's what that would look like. Super strong, right? All of you parents that have second graders. If your kid could pick up a Prius, they'd be as strong as an ant. But notice what scripture says here. Go to the ant, you sluggard, consider its ways and be wise. And that next part does not speak to the strength of the ant, does it? No, it says it has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it continues to do what it needs to do. Scripture does not highlight the ant's strengths. Doesn't even highlight the hard work. It highlights and says the ant is wise because it consistently works. It's a self-starter. It has self-discipline. It has integrity. It has character. It has a good work ethic. But it focuses on the consistency of work. Not the working hard. Consistency of work. That is what leads us into wisdom. That's what takes the knowledge, the understanding, and starts to move it to wisdom, is that we are consistent in our work. We have a healthy rhythm of work and rest, but we are consistent in our work. We have character and integrity in regards to our work. We don't have a boss lording over us, make sure you get that done, and, and always, always only working when someone is making us work or telling us what to do. No, the ant does it on its own. That's a work ethic that God says, this is how you work. Now, that same work ethic is also moved into the New Testament. Colossians chapter 3, Paul says this to the early church. Verse 23 says, whatever you do. Say that phrase with me. Whatever you do. One more time. Whatever you do, do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters, since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as your reward. Look at this last part. It is the Lord Christ you are serving. 
Whatever you do, work hard. Whatever you do, work at it with all your what? Your heart. Mountain Lake, if you are a believer in Jesus, not just for this church, but believers in general, we should be the best workers this world has ever seen because of this passage right here and what we're reading out of Proverbs. Doesn't mean we are the best at our job. Doesn't even mean that we work the hardest, but we have the best work ethic because we see our jobs and our work differently than the rest of the world. As a believer, we look at our work and we say, I'm serving God. I am working for him, not, not anybody else. Work hard, but work with all your heart. It says there in the very beginning, kind of clears the air, whatever you do. But that really blows our idea of job out of the water, doesn't it? This is more than just what you get paid for. Whatever you do, work at it with all your heart. Whatever you do. See, a lot of our jobs, what we would consider all of our jobs to be work. It's work. Jobs are work. But not all work is a job. And sometimes we confuse those. We, we only work at the things that we're getting paid for. But understand, here, Scripture is talking about a much more, more general sense of the word work. Marriage is work. And I don't get paid for it. I don't know if you do or not, but we do not get paid to be married. And it is a lot of work. It takes effort, constant effort. There's struggles, there's conflict, there's tension. It's a lot more work for my wife, but I still have to work a little bit at it. It's a lot of work. Parents, now if there's a part where you're gonna say amen, here's the time you do it, moms and dads. Parenting is work. Yes, it is. It's a lot of work. Raising a child and, and teaching them. I have three under the age of five. All of you parents that have teenagers, like you haven't seen anything yet, Brian. I know. It's a lot of work. Relationships in general are work. Family is work. Our relationship with God is even work. Finances are work. Man, that's frustrating. That's stressful. You can't just put your finances on autopilot or any of your relationships on autopilot and just expect it all to work out okay. No, it takes us working in them and on them and at them, constantly working. Healthy living is by, by all means work. That's why we, we get into healthy living kicks and then and that's a lot of work. So we just go back to doing what we did before. <laughs> Even the things we enjoy doing, the hobbies that you have, the recreation, which recreation, by the way, recreation, God rested after he created. We rest after even that. It continues to be work. It's maybe fun work, but it's still work. We have to understand work is more than just what we get paid for. Work has given to us by God to, to then continue to do what he's called us to do. And it's work. It's a lot of work. Let me show it to you this way. This might help continue to broaden your idea of work and make this hit home just a little bit more. There are four categories that every single one of your work, not job, but work, falls into. First one is pay. You get paid to do that work. You get a paycheck for the work. You are able to provide for your family because of that work. You also have work that you do enjoy. These would probably be more of your hobbies or, or whatever else. Still, you enjoy it, you like to do it, you love to do it, you enjoy it. There's work that's, that's based around your value. What I mean by value is what you have to offer. You have a certain skill set, gift set. You have an ability that you then can offer to another person or group or organization or business, and, and it's helpful. What you have is unique and it has value. And so you are able to do a specific kind of work because of the talents, gifts, and abilities that you have. And then the very last one is help. Work that benefits someone else more than yourself. Now there's technically a, a fifth one, fifth category that I'm not even gonna bother to put up here. It's the, it just has to get done category. It's like paying your taxes. It doesn't fit anywhere in here. You still have to actually do it. So there is a few pieces of work that you just have to do because it's just part of life. But most of it fits within these four. And let me show you how you interact with each of these four categories. I'll tell you my very first job. Very first job, I started when I was 16. I was a dishwasher. Not just any old dishwasher. I was a dishwasher at a nursing home. That was a job. Now let me ask you, did I get paid to be a dishwasher? Yes, from 16 to 18, I brought in a paycheck every other week for washing dishes at a nursing home. Check. Did I enjoy being a dishwasher at a nursing home? I will tell you right now, I most certainly did not. We're not gonna put anything in that box. 
value? Did I have some incredible gift set, skill, and talent that made me just a wonderful dishwasher that this nursing home could not live without? No, I promise. Anybody could have done that job. Help. Was it helpful? Did it benefit someone else more than me? Now, here's a, tr- it's a trick question. Technically, the answer is yes, but I'm telling you, I would not have done it if I did not get paid. So therefore, it doesn't count at all. <laughs> So I was a dishwasher, that work served one purpose, for me to get paid, so I could pay for my car and my insurance as I continued to grow up. Let's go on to another job, another element of work, being a dad. Do I get paid to be a dad? No. Should I get paid to be a dad? Yes, absolutely. That's a whole other sermon, we'll we'll walk through that one one day. Do I enjoy being a dad? Most of the time. Yes. Yes. We record all of our messages, so there will be a day where all of my kids will grow up and want to see what daddy did when they were little, so because they will watch this, I'm going to say, yes, I enjoy it. (laughs) Value, do I have some super incredible gift set that allows me to be a dad? I would say not really, because I'm telling you, I am walking blind through this whole thing. God said, Brian, congratulations, you're going to be a dad. And I said, okay. And he navigates that. So there's, there's really nothing of value that I have to be a dad other than I'm just willing. I'm like, okay, we'll figure this out as we go. Help, is it more beneficial for them than it is me? I hope, I hope they would say yes to that, but they're not here, so I'm going to say yes. Yes, absolutely. Here's another element of work in my life. I love to play tennis, and it's work. Do I get paid to play tennis? You don't think I'm that good. A lot of people get, played, get paid to play tennis, but I'm not one of them. So no, I don't get paid to play tennis. Do I enjoy it? Absolutely, it's fun. Do I have an incredible skill set, gift set, or value to add to the tennis world? No, or else I'd get paid for it. You see how that works? So nothing there. Is it helpful to anybody other than me? No, it's strictly just because I enjoy it. Let me give you one last one here. Meals by Grace is a nonprofit that's in both Forsyth County and also uh, recently this last year moved up to Dawson County. And let me just tell you what it is real quick. Uh, Up in Dawson County, what my family and our our campus up there is involved in is uh, once a month, the second Saturday of every month, we show up and we pack meals in boxes and then we actually deliver them. So we put a box in our minivan and we deliver it to a family in our county um, in need. And that's been something that I'm part of, my wife's part of, our kids go and are part of that. All three of my kids, they're part of that. It's, a, it's great work for us as a family and also for our community. Do we get paid to volunteer with Meals by Grace? No. Do we enjoy it as a family? Yeah, we do. It's become a, a fun family event for us on that second Saturday. Do we have any special talent and gift set that allows us to pack and deliver meals? No. All, all you do is... you put food in a box, and then you take it to somebody's house. That's it. So yeah, no value. Does it help somebody else? Yes, absolutely. You see how this works? Now, what I need you to pay attention to is the areas that are blank. Because what we would like is for one job, one element of work to fill everything up all the time, every time. It doesn't work that way. That's why, especially our younger generation, they look at the job and say, no, I'm not going to do that because it doesn't give me all of these. And it's always the grass is greener on the other side. But what we understand is there's different elements of it. There's different categories. And and one element of work, one aspect of work doesn't always need to fill it all up. Great example, a a guy named Mark Varka. He's up at our Dawson campus, has been volunteering him and his family since we launched the campus, coming up on three years. And Monday through Friday, Mark gets paid to be a, a banker downtown Atlanta. He is a banker in downtown Atlanta, Monday through Friday. Now, on the weekends, on Saturday and Sunday, he is our production coordinator, which means all things video, lighting, sound. He runs all of that and has an entire and incredible volunteer team underneath him. That's what he does on the weekend. Now, I don't pay him to do that. He wishes I could pay him to do that, but he doesn't get paid for it. So he's a banker to get paid, but you could ask him, he's like, well, why do you do that on the weekends? Why are you the production coordinator for Dawson on, on Saturdays and Sundays? Well, because he enjoys it. He definitely has value. I mean, he has a gift set that's incredible, and he's helping other people. He has found a rhythm of meeting all of these. Now, just looking at mine, the value is missing. That's why I do what I do. God has given me a gift set and a passion to shepherd and to pastor other people. And so you put that one up there, and you'll see that you put all of these together. That's where fulfillment in work comes from. Understand, when you start to figure out 
and get check boxes in all of these, not necessarily all in one job, but when you get them in every other place, that's when you are fulfilled. When you have some gaps, that's when you start saying things like, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm burned out, I'm stressed out. God has given us work. And we have made the, the mistake of saying, the one thing that we do that pays us should do all of these. That's not the case. We say, okay, God, what work have you given me in my life? There's a lot of work that we do. Where does it fall on the board? That's what fulfillment in our work does. That's what it looks like. Wisdom is telling us this, work well. Wisdom says work well, but make sure that, again, we have the right rhythm that God has modeled for us. Work well, but also rest well, but then get back to work. (laughs) If we work well, rest well, and never get back to work, we are the definition of a sluggard. Work well, rest well, figure out this. This is what fulfillment, again, looks like. Work well, rest well, then get back to work. Now, I want you to see something. I'm going to read basically Old Testament all the way to the New Testament, a bunch of scriptures. And again, you're not going to be able to keep up with me. I'm going to read them real quick off of here. But I want you to help pay attention to the commonality between all of them. There's a common denominator through all of these passages, Old Testament all the way into New Testament. And I want you to pay attention to what they are. Exodus chapter 3, starting verse 1. Now Moses was tending the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, and he led the flock to the far side of the wilderness, uh, next to the mountain of God. And there there was an angel of the Lord appeared to him in flames of fire and within a bush. Judges 6. The angel of the Lord came and sat down next to Gideon, who was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. 1 Samuel 16. So he asked, Jesse, are these all the sons that you have? There is still the youngest, Jesse answered. He is tending the sheep. 1 Kings 19. So Elijah went from there and found Elisha. He was plowing with 12 yoke of oxen and he himself was driving the 12th pair. Matthew 4, 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen. Come follow me, he said. I'll teach you how to fish for people. Matthew 9. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting at a tax collector's booth. Follow me, he told him. Matthew got up and followed him. I could keep going on and on and on. Old Testament and New Testament. Mount Lake, you tell me, what is the commonality of, amongst all those? They were in the middle of work. They were tending the sheep. They were shepherds. They were out in the field. They were threshing wheat. They were plowing. They were fishermen fishing. He was sitting at a tax collector's booth. Every single one of these, and we see that theme throughout Scripture, God is honoring the worker, not the workaholic. Please hear that. We get in trouble when we get those four out of balance, out of rhythm. Our relationship with God, work, rest, and family. But when done well, done within the scriptural context that God designed, God speaks to us in the midst of our work. He calls us to to other things in the midst of our work. God uses us in our work in ways that we never would or could have even imagined. What's neat is God's not done working still. Remember back in Genesis 2? After the creation, he what? What did he do after all the work? He rested, but he did exactly what wisdom says. He got back to work. From that moment on, starting in chapter three, that's when sin entered the world, God began to work to pull us back to him. Since that moment of of sin, God has been working to bring us back to him. And when we come back to him and we get back to that relationship with him because of Jesus and our faith in him, saved by grace, saved by faith, from that moment on, guess what? God continues to work. He works to get us back to him and then he continues to work to grow us. That's called discipleship. That's called growing in him to become more like him. Philippians says it this way in chapter two, verse 13. For God is working in you. And let that sink in for a second. Because I have no doubt there are many in here that feel like God has taken a back seat in their life. You don't feel like God is, is actively involved in your life anymore. God is working in you. He's not stopped. He's not sitting with his feet propped up. He's working. God is working in you, and here's what he's working to do. To give you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. That means to become more like him. God works to bring us in a relationship with him, and then God continues to work to grow us to be more like him. God's not done with us yet. He has not stopped working Work is good, it's from him. Our work is good and he uses it. Where are you at? Where are you at with your work? Where are you even at with God's work in you? If you go back to the coffee cups, you have knowledge of the facts, you have understanding, 
And so far, in the last 25 or so minutes, that's all you have currently. You have some facts. You've learned some nice little information. You've learned that an ant can carry 50 times its body weight, and that's the same as a second grader carrying a Prius. You've learned some really cool things this morning. I hope you have begun to understand the meaning of them, <laughs> of here's what it means to work. Here's what it means to, to be a sluggard or somebody who's working wisely. Here's what it means that God has given us work and that it's good. Here's what it means to have the right rhythm of God, work, rest, and family. I hope you understand some of that now. But man, what happens next is on you. That's the wisdom. That's the application. That's what you do starting from this moment on. That's what you wake up starting next, tomorrow in this next week. So I'd have you ask yourself this question. What do I need to work on? What do I need to work on? That takes it from the knowledge and the understanding and moves it into the application, which is the wisdom. What do you need to work on? What do you need to let God work on in you? What do you need to let God work on through you? How do you need to get your work back in rhythm and back in order? Begin to answer that question. and We will begin to live out the wisdom that God has given us in his word. But if you don't have a relation with Jesus yet, it starts there. Let him work on you, let him work in you, and let him continue to work through you. And he honors our work because it came from him. Let me pray for us. Father God, thank you so much for what you teach us, how you help us understand, but more so how you speak wisdom in our heart. Your word says that if any of us lacks wisdom, all we need to do is ask you for it. Well, we are here asking, God, give us the wisdom. Use your spirit to help us navigate this life. Help us to make the wise choices, the wise decisions, to see things the way that you see them, to feel the way that you feel. May we, as your word says, become more like you. We know that you have your work cut out for you as you do that in each and every one of us, but God, we are open to you working in us as we continue to do the work that you've laid before us. God, I would ask that your spirit would continue to remind us of the good work you've laid in front of us. Help us to to figure out the right, uh, the right and wrong rhythms of work. Help us to figure out what we need to continue to work at and what we need to let go of. You have given us work for good. May we keep it within your context of your relationship with us, the work you give us, the rest that you require of us, and the family that you have blessed us with. May we continue to walk in wisdom in our work. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, one of your next steps is you feel God working on you and in you. I want to give you an opportunity. Nathan mentioned it if you're here when he did the welcome. Uh, On the other side of your worship guide, the very back actually, uh, is an opportunity for baptism and some other life change decisions. I'd encourage you, if that's the next step, if you've not made that decision yet, let God's spirit continue to work on and in you to make that your next step. We would love to answer any questions you've got. Parents, if your kids are asking questions about baptism, mark it on your card. We'll follow up with you this week. But as Nathan said, we have a huge baptism celebration the very last Sunday of this month. Would love to you to be, love for you to be part of it, your kids, students to be part of it as we celebrate more life change and the work that God is doing in every single one of us. Well, if you're new here or if it's been a while since you've been here, you're starting to get back in the swing of things, make sure to head out to the lobby, visit the newcomer suite. You'll get all the details and all the information about the rest of the things coming up this summer and even into the fall. I'll be out in the lobby. Would love to say hey to you. Would love to meet you. If you live in Dawson County, then I should see you next week. Don't worry. Chris is doing the shameless plug up there as well. So we are excited for what God's doing, what he's doing in your life, and what he will continue to do as we move forward. Have an awesome week, and I'll see you next Sunday.